My name is Alaha, and I'm the head of events at Textbook Ventures, which is Sydney's premium um, community for supporting students in startup tech and VC. And I'm here with my co-host, Sharon. Hi everyone, I'm Sharon. So I'm currently managing growth here at Textbook Ventures. So today we'll be covering um, the fundamentals of crypto, blockchain and careers in the industry with our amazing panel of guest speakers. So we have Tristan Frizzer, who's originally a machine learning scientist from Atlassian. We have Karen Cohen, who's a deputy chairperson at Blockchain Australia. And we also have Michael Cotton, who's a co-founder of Meld Ventures. So uh, hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me guys. Uh, my name is Michael Cotton. I'm based uh, up in Brisbane. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Meld Ventures. Uh, we, we specialize in both backing and incubating uh, predominantly blockchain businesses and blockchain projects. Uh, we have two of our own projects as well, Meld Gold, which digitizes gold and silver and platinum uh, and allows it to be tradable in a, a distributed physical ecosystem across the world. Uh, and then we also have another project called Algo Mint, which uh, works on interoperability between different blockchains allowing assets to move between different blockchains seamlessly. So, for example, Bitcoin can transition onto our grand blockchain and Solana blockchain uh, and be utilized in different ecosystems. Uh, and these days, uh, we, we work a lot on what the future holds for blockchain and DeFi and real use cases around how blockchain can be adopted for future users. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Tristan. So I worked for, I guess, past year and a half at Atlassian as a machine learning scientist. So everything machine learning, deep learning, I was really into that AI stuff and worked between here, Sydney and Silicon Valley for a little bit. Uh, and then more recently, I guess, pivoted to do my own startup, which has been a dream of mine for a number of years. And so working in the decentralized finance or DeFi space, uh, I guess. Uh, and so what we're building is a decentralized exchange or what's commonly known as a, a DEX and we're building that on the Solana blockchain which is like the world's most like performant uh, uh, L1 blockchain and yeah I've been doing that for a couple of months now uh, and have like grown the team pretty significantly uh, things seem to be going pretty well so far so it's interesting going on that founder journey. Thanks for having me uh, my name is Karen Cohen and um known affectionately in the blockchain world as block mum i've been in the industry for about four years and my specialty is coming out of the hr um, traditional hr world um, and moving into the startup space and um, working with businesses uh, to help them uh, with their blockchain problems and their people problems so doing outsourced hr for companies that don't necessarily have a full-time HR person, need recruitment, need help with training, leadership and management, and specializing in emerging tech. For our new listeners, what is crypto and blockchain? And what problems do you see this technology solving? So um, it's basically crypto's digital currency, and it originally started, I guess, to bank the unbankable uh, and to move money quite quickly. So that when I started in 2017, uh, Bitcoin was going nuts and... Um, it's still going nuts, up and down, but still nuts. Uh, but yeah, one of the examples that really made me think about uh, a practical approach to it was I went to the bank and I had an employee who was from Holland and I went to transfer her money across the world and I paid $40 for that transaction. And at her end, she paid 20 euro. And in the middle, somewhere along the way, 10 euro went missing. And my bank said, no. Oh, well, we didn't take it. And her bank said, no, oh, well, we didn't take it. And so that sort of makes you think somewhere in all of these transactions globally, someone's taking money and nobody's claiming who it is. And so if every transaction that goes across the world is losing 10 euros, well, that's a really big pay, um, case for cryptocurrency. So, you know, I could transfer money to Michael right now in a flick of a second using crypto. And that's a really great uh, business case. And from the blockchain perspective, um, it's really based on a digital ledger that, you know, can't be compromised. So there's multiple copies. Michael could never say that I didn't give him the money because there's a copy and we're all watching it um, on the blockchain and we can see that, that that transaction happened. And so there's multiple people um, using that. And so that creates, I guess, a whole universe of trusted data where we can trust what we're seeing as opposed to something that's changeable and nobody can claim who did what. So that, that's, I guess, my, uh, my take on, uh, easy take on cryptocurrency and blockchain. So I think Kat, Karen covered it pretty well, but it's basically like blockchain is like distributed ledger technology, I guess. So everyone around the world who might be running uh, like Ethereum validation and whatnot will keep, I guess, a 
uh, their own kind of copy of the ledger. And so people will commit transactions that will get validated by this kind of like distributed network of people. Um, and then if there's this essentially what's called consensus, I guess, between all the different operators and nodes that will get committed to a blockchain. And a blockchain is just like a data structure for those of you with like a bit of a computer science background. It's almost like a linked list where it's like a lot of transactions get put in a block and you kind of stack these blocks up and each block refers to the previous block essentially. So if you try and go and tamper with some of the transactions, it actually breaks that kind of sequence and you can see that people have tampered. And so it's what's called immutable, um, which means it can't be changed. And so I guess crypto is just kind of like a use case over that. People are trying to build digital currencies, essentially. You'll know like obviously Bitcoin, like Ether and, and like, you know, the infinite other ones that there are out there. Um, there's also just like a really cool ecosystem around using blockchain, I guess, rather than just pure currencies and transactions, but using it for just general, uh, like people call Ethereum almost like the world computer, essentially. You can basically write what's called smart contracts, which are like self-executing pieces of code that you basically chop, chuck up on the blockchain and it's like hosted by a bunch of people. So rather than AWS or some kind of like backend hosting provider going and running your code for you, it's run and maintained by like, you know, all the people around who run the network. And you can just kind of have this app that it's, I guess what's called a decentralized app or DAP that basically anyone can interact with. And you can't just have it like taken down or kind of tampered with because it's kind of run by this big community. And so that's kind of what's underpinning a lot of this big wave of decentralized finance. People are taking what was in traditional finance. So say you have a bank that does loans, instead of you going through CBA or something other, instead you write a piece of code essentially that does the same thing and can kind of write the transaction to be like, hey, I'm gonna like lend money and that kind of stuff. Uh, and this just run through this self-executing code and you can basically rebuild those kind of financial primitives uh, on the blockchain. It's probably the only sort of additional pieces we are seeing different methods of that consensus and, and that database structure uh, developing. So a great example, Tristan building on Solana. Solana uses a proof of history, which is a really fascinating new tech that uh, I think is really cool and really changed the way transactions take place. And, and we're seeing incredible speeds and costs achieved with, with Solana, which is fantastic. Uh, you got other blockchains like Algorand that is like a pure proof of stake, which is also uh, another sort of new technology to the blockchain space that we are seeing differences. So a, a great example would be uh, recently with the drop in May, Ethereum reached about $71 US to do a transaction and about 45 minutes to complete a transaction, which as you can imagine, if you're buying a cup of coffee or something like that at that moment, it's obviously a terrible option. Uh, whereas like Solana, about, correct me if I'm wrong, Tristan, like about one one fiftieth of a cent or something like that, I think at the minute to do a transaction and sub, sub a second, um our brand you know a tenth of a cent and you know sub four seconds uh so some of the new technologies that aren't sacrificing on security and decentralization are bringing some really cool innovations i think the end goal of this technology is really around automation and and removing elements of of the, the necessary trust inside different types of transactions or different types of interactions uh, I think there's a really good reason why we shouldn't put blockchain into everything. There's plenty of reasons why blockchain will never be able to do uh, a, an identity verification on chain because you actually need outside data and outside information. But <clears throat> as Tristan said, you don't need to trust someone with your money in a loan process if it can be automated in an immutable way on blockchain. Or, you know, you don't need to trust a funds manager as such if you can actually recreate uh, decentralized, trustless ways for funds management, you know, which there's some great projects coming out, projects like DHedge. So really, I think uh, blockchain is really about removing that middleman where you're actually having to trust a third party to complete a process or to monitor or act as like the, the intermediary for a process. You know, so with blockchain technology, a lot of that need disappearing, uh, which is a great thing. Um, we would love to know from each of our speakers, what led you to pursue a career in crypto? I don't know. I've just been really interested in crypto and blockchain technology for a number of years. I guess I like, uh, one of my friends got me into it as all people do in like 2017 in like the last bull run. And so it was obviously kind of like speculating on all these coins, like seeing what was happening. And I approach it less from like the engineering aspect. Um, but then in some of my like final year computer science subjects, I took a few courses on distributed computing. And one of the assignments was like, basically like build your own blockchain from scratch in Java or something or other, I think. Uh, and that was kind of cool. And one of the lecturers was running this project. I think it was Red Belly Blockchain and they were trying to do like visa level transactions uh, on the blockchain. I don't know what ended up happening to that company, but it was like really interesting seeing what was possible and 
learning about consensus mechanisms and how you operate like this huge network that's kind of like globally distributed. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I got more interested. It started learning Solidity, which is what Ethereum contracts are written in like end of last year, because uh, I wanted to approach it from the development aspect because uh, I'm not an incredible trader, I will admit. And then, um, yeah, I think there was like huge opportunities. I learned about Solana, which is one of these kind of up and coming blockchains. Actually, it was luckily enough to meet Anatoly, who's like the, the founder of it. And we had like a really great chat. The guys like worked in uh, telco, uh, like distributed computing and built a lot of the 3G, 4G networks and that kind of stuff. And so like he was kind of the right person. I could tell he had a lot of like technical expertise in like building these huge systems. Um, and it was just like a really interesting problem being able to use that framework and build really awesome, like scalable decentralized applications that were kind of like permissionless and you can kind of trade all this like peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, it was just really exciting. Uh, Michael, do you want to share your story? Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, a friend of mine started telling me about Bitcoin in about 2015. Uh, just, just naturally, my first reaction was, all right, tell me about the technology. And he had absolutely no idea. Uh, he was more just her, you know, thought it was exciting and the price was going up and how great. And, and it was quite a common thread I found with anyone who, you know, was in, interested or was really promoting Bitcoin amongst the people I knew was they didn't actually know a lot about the technology. And for me, you know, that's always been one of the fundamentals. I really want to understand what's actually happening in the background and why there is value drivers. Uh, so to be honest, when he couldn't answer any of the questions, I dismissed it and was like, you're insane. Uh, not too long after someone else brought it up and I started asking questions and they could actually give me some answers, which was enough to sort of intrigue me to go, okay, I've got to dig a bit deeper here. Uh, and once I started digging into, into crypto and blockchain uh, and started looking at things of what, like what Ethereum was doing uh, and some of the fantastic developments around what can actually be utilized with this technology, you know, I think also keeping in mind that, you know, it, it, it very much was internet 1.0 in 2015 and 2016. So you know, it, it was, you couldn't judge it on the surface of what was happening. It was this sort of chaos of crazy ideas and throwing pickles at walls that uh, was really, really fascinating. But from uh, fundamentals of the technology, I knew it was going to be in some, some form or another a part of the future uh, and decided that it was, a, it was a place where I wanted to be and started uh, moving from where I, what I was doing, which was uh, I started a gold company here in Australia when I was 18 it's now one of the largest in the country. Uh, so I'm still the major shareholder, but I work purely in blockchain these days. So it was a fairly big choice to transition, uh, but very thankful that, that I did. Yeah, I went to a party and someone said, hey, do you want to be HR manager for a blockchain company? And I went home and I asked my husband what blockchain was and he started explaining and my eyes glazed over and I'm like, oh my God, what am I... Anyway, so I just said yes, and um, I thought that Bitcoin was blockchain for about the first three months, and I found myself running the blockchain centers. I had to learn baptism of fire. We were running lots of meetups and education, and yeah, it was really fun. So um, yeah, I just spent a lot of time in imposter syndrome land, thinking I didn't know enough or couldn't look under the hood enough or, you know, not technical enough, but I think... Um, it's, it's nice to be able to explain it in simple terms that people can understand. We don't really necessarily understand how our email gets to our inbox. And in the same way, I don't feel like I need to understand the bits and blocks, but can understand the implications and can help people come along the journey with us. So I've just got a general question here for the panel, and I would just like someone to go through, I suppose, the fundamentals. Um, and so in the crypto ecosystem, could someone just go through, say, the different types of cryptocurrencies that we see, um, tokenomics and a coin's burn rate? It's a pretty diverse mixture. Uh, I, think, I think I often sort of <clears throat> talk about the, the marketplace as, as kind of a giant experiment. You know, we still really are in this uh, experimental phase to a great deal where, where we really are seeing a lot of interesting concepts trials, we're really seeing a lot of financial models. And I, I think to sort of take a step back, essentially, you know, with, with the current, with the financial system, if you want to enter inside the traditional financial system, the barriers to entry are, are enormous, are insane, and there's huge limitations on what you can actually do. You know, what blockchain has done, especially on the financial side, is it's really allowed people to have a blank slate and say, look, just Put your mind to what if you could recreate the system what would it look like if you had all this technology within blockchain what would you actually build and what would you create so we have seen this crazy chaos of uh crypto kitties i don't know if anyone ever followed crypto kitties which was probably one of the wackiest uh, i just love the word wacky but probably one of the wackiest ideas we saw come to blockchain tech where you could buy 
uh, a blockchain cat and you could make the cat's mate and then you could have another blockchain cat would come from that and it would be a next generation of cat and they some of them went into you know i think the, the highest sold cat went for close to a million dollars if i remember correctly um you know all the way through to really sophisticated financial products uh, and how we're seeing those token models come to market is quite interesting as well like we're seeing you know, I think it's best described as value because in reality, for the tokens to be effective, they have to have value. Now, it, that ranges from Crypto Kitties, which is this bizarre, you know, gamified style of value, all the way through to things like Dogecoin, which really is, you know, meme value to a degree and hype value and pump and dump kind of value, uh, through to the more sophisticated assets like, you know, Yearn Finance does your um, your investment vaults where you can actually deposit your funds and buy smart contracts. The assets are deployed to earn yield. Uh, and then if you're invested in Yearn, you actually get a portion of that yield. So we're seeing some really interesting versions. In terms of the tokenomics side, we see everything from purely passive where you just hold the tokens, you can actually earn earn money all the way through to having to put your tokens to work. So a great example would be actually like staking your tokens on platforms like mStable, where your money then becomes like the insurance contract behind the product. Uh, and then we have other assets where you, for example, are lending your money out peer to peer in a, in a trustless way to uh, another user who's in need of funding, or you're actually providing market liquidity. So instead of like a in the gold industry, a massive gold trader being the market maker and offering liquidity in the gold, you can actually deposit your funds and become a market maker on a DEX, you know, on the lines of what Tristan's building. Um, mm. So, you know, there's there's a really interesting scattered version of use cases. And then you've also got now, you know, the, the new generation of DAOs, which uh, is also fantastic. Like, I, I love that space. It's really, really interesting in, in sort of this distributed governance that's uh, so it, it's distributed autonomous organization is what it stands for with the idea that companies may no, long, may, not, may no longer have sovereignty as such. They might actually be a cloud-based organization that's governed by the collective of investors or holders in the project themselves versus being governed by a particular company or entity that's, that's based in a sovereign state. So in those cases, the value can again be via yield. Um, yield is interesting because it's not always in, in fiat or, or money. It's in you know, cryptocurrency, which there's a whole nother discussion about how the values derive there. But it could also be in power or having your say or having you, the ability to be a part of decision making and things you, you think you either bring value or things that are valuable to be a part of. As your role as an investor, like what sort of attributes do you look for when you do invest in uh, blockchain companies? Yeah, I think I think the the first one. Uh, there's a lot of different strategies. Uh, mm -hmm. Look from from my personal view, you know, the first the first thing is is it a good idea. Uh, you know, I think that's and is it an idea that I can understand? Uh, is it an idea I can bring value to? You know, we try to really invest in things we think we can also help with and actually bring something more than money. Because um, I think from founders' point of view, it's great to get money. We all we definitely all need it. Uh, but at the same token, it's also great to work with people who can be helpful, who can be collaborative, who can be supportive. You know, they're all the great things that come on top of the financial side. Uh, in terms of what we look for, so we look for a good idea. If we actually really like the idea, we think it has a business model. Uh, the next step is looking at the team. You know, is there a team here that can execute this idea? You know, have they got all the different elements covered? If they haven't got them all covered, have they got a good plan that will cover these different areas? So such as tech development, marketing, community management, their actual financial strategy, how they're actually going to cash flow this product. Uh, then secondly, is there a real business model here? Um, so, you know, is there actually something to monetize at the end of this? And, and monetize is not necessarily the right word. Sometimes it can be, is there value being delivered and created in this process? Uh, and if there is value being created, if I put, if I sort of look from an investor side, is that value being delivered in a way that benefits the investment that we've made as, as a venture company? Um, so not all our investments are about making money as well. Sometimes we more do them for the love of the idea or we think it's going to be a really interesting concept. You know, we're quite big on that ethos. Um, but, you know, in, in reality, for most investment firms, it's about, you know, will this idea monetize or bring value in a way that will deliver a return on the investment? Um, I think lastly is... And this particularly applies to crypto and blockchain. This is a very long answer, Sharon. I'm sorry. It particularly <laughs> applies to investment in blockchain is, you know, does this idea have, have a long-term outlook? You know, is this something that's going to have a 12-month shelf life? Is this something that's going to have a 10-year shelf life? Is it solving real problems that are going to have real use cases in the future? And the other checklist for that, which is this is where it really becomes important in crypto, is how is, how is that 
that model and go-to-market strategy being deployed. If it's, for example, giving away tokens uh, by, and delivering like a return by giving people additional tokens, fantastic. As long as when you get to the end of that runway and you've given out all the tokens, there's still a real business model and still longevity to the idea because we do see a lot of products that end up giving away all their tokens, get to the end, the tokens run out, and then everyone exits the project. And all of a sudden they go talk to the next project that's doing something else. So, you know, I think really sort of understanding what that outlook looks like. We're, we're more of a long-term investor, which is probably why we look at the long-term. There's plenty of short-term investors as well. Uh, but I think in terms of for long-term quality projects for the future, that's, that's a pretty decent checklist. So I just have a general question. So from, say, from a founder perspective, as well as an investor perspective, investor perspective so what do you sort of see um, is the future for DeFi and what are the current trends that you are observing currently so I think it's like really starting to kick off I guess there was like last year like this whole what they call like DeFi summer which is where like a lot of these protocols really blew up and you have you know strategies like Yearn and whatnot and Compound doing kind of uh, lending and like these kind of early financial primitives that I think were like fairly simple but that was kind of like a good uh use case or kind of proof there um, and I think that's just kind of growing pretty quickly people are seeing like this is like legitimate use case for for crypto and blockchain which I think it was kind of struggling a bit more to find necessarily like useful value outside of that like, it's definitely not really viable as like a world you know transaction network like Visa or something um, but DeFi is super interesting I think yeah there's just like a lot of people who are taking existing ideas from like traditional finance or what people like to call TradFi uh, and they bring that to DeFi. Um, and so people are building all this new stuff. Um, and so I think people are getting more and more complicated. Like you're getting protocols now building in kind of like derivative space where you actually get into like quite complex uh, like financial infrastructure. Um, and people are able to build stuff that's like not really possible at all in traditional finance. Like you have really cool concepts. Um, well, at least there was stuff like there was like uh, perpetual futures. I guess I was done a bit on BitMEX, but that's become like the huge thing on DeFi as well, which are like futures contracts that don't have like a set kind of endpoint. They just kind of roll over infinitely and people can trade leverage and that kind of stuff. Um, you also get like a bunch of cool stuff. Like people have what's called AMMs are like a big thing, automatic market makers. Um, and these are basically platforms like Uniswap where you can kind of swap between two tokens. Say I want to go from Bitcoin to Ethereum. Uh, you kind of have these two pools and you can kind of do this kind of pretty simple swap between them uh, and it's just done peer to contract. Um, so rather than actually having a counterparty that I have to swap tokens with, uh, basically you can just kind of swap with this kind of like piece of code and it will kind of like go and kind of give you the necessary payout. Uh, and so there's like a lot of cool stuff where people are building these open source protocols, I guess. And it's like, imagine, you know, like one of the banks was completely open source. You could see their code. You can see how they work and that kind of stuff. You can just raise a pull, pull request and kind of like modify the protocol and add new things. I think that's really cool because you get the community essentially building it. Uh, and then kind of a consequence of that is because a lot of stuff is open source, you get what's called composability um, between different protocols. I think there's a big trend towards that. And it's where like, you know, say I want to, you know, trade on some kind of exchange and then I want to borrow from a different one. You know, I could borrow off like Compound or something or other, and then I could use my funds elsewhere on another platform and swap it for something else. And then I could do something else with it there and then kind of like, you know, repay my loan or something or other. And so it's almost kind of, yeah, you're able to like, you know, join all these different financial primitives together, um, I think is like a really cool thing. So it's like, yeah, traditional finance, but like open source and everything kind of integrates really nicely. It's not these like walled gardens. So what are your views then on crypto regulation? How do you think this sort of um, plays into crypto's long-term adoption? Um, yeah, I think it's like super gray area. I think people are still kind of struggling to figure out what the best way is or kind of how to define different stuff. Um, I think this tokens are still in this kind of gray area where people are like, is it a security? Is it like a, you know, uh, is it like a utility token? Is this just kind of some like widget of the platform? So I think it's really hard to categorize this stuff. I think the regulation is still super unclear and it kind of really depends in what country you're in. Uh, I think Australia is still kind of like getting onto that bandwagon, figuring it out. Um, whereas some other countries, I guess, are a bit more advanced in the kind of regulation, figuring that out. Um, but yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not like the expert on this kind of situation. Um, we would love to ask Karen, your focus is on the people side of blockchain. Uh, what are some of the key trends you're seeing in this space? Uh, yeah, so it's it's been a, an interesting journey. I think in 2017, when I started with the industry, we could see that blockchain developers were going to be in high demand. And we tried to create like a, 
Ethereum boot camp type of thing. It was really hard to sell. Um, employers weren't willing to invest in people. Uh, and now I, my phone rings every day and they say, have you got an uh, Ethereum developer because of DeFi? Everyone wants to go on DeFi. Um, yeah, and also seeing other roles coming up now in the space, which is fabulous. I think in 2020, I felt like the world died and nothing was happening, but uh, I think during COVID, those that were funded, we're seeing they they were programming, they were head down, bum up. And 2021, we're seeing some beautiful projects emerge and um, people need people to sell them and design them and list them and build communities. Uh, it's a shame we can't meet in person for events. So a lot of it's gone online like you guys. Um, it's because that's where we used to see a lot of that um, cross-pollination of people. You know, people would stand up and they'd say, hey, I've got a startup idea. I need a developer. I need a designer. And, and people would say, oh, I want to get involved in this in this project, and which is a really good way to, to get involved and to see how um, other people are doing things and help to build them. So it's definitely the demand is there. Um, we now need to work on the supply. So I suppose like a hot topic at the moment currently is with NFTs sort of disrupting the arts and collectibles space. So I'm really interested in sort of getting an explanation of how they work and potentially, you know, how we could potentially create one ourselves. I've tried to steer clear of NFTs a little bit because I know there's a lot of like hype around it that I yeah. try and dissociate from. But I think they're still like kind of a, a cool thing. Um, and I think there are probably like legitimate use cases for it. Um, yeah, people have just been using it a lot for like collectibles, like art, like content creators and that kind of stuff. Uh, and they basically, yeah, obviously use blockchain. So rather than, so NFT stands for non-fungible token. So that is in opposition to, I guess, what's called a fungible token, which would be just saying like Bitcoin, where it's like one Bitcoin here is the same as one Bitcoin here. You can kind of swap them. Um, but when you have like non-fungibility, I guess, it's just like this one artifact i guess that you have like can't be replaced or swapped with anything else so it's kind of it's like this uh provable scarcity i guess so you know if i've got this baseball card that someone's nft'd um it's got this dig digital signature and it just basically means i've got like the one true authentic copy and no one else can kind of uh i guess have it and so it's really useful for people who want to sell like artworks and that kind of stuff you can say i have 10 copies of this and basically people can prove you know say you auction it out and you buy it you know, you're buying the authentic thing. You can go and like cryptographically, you know, go and figure out if the hash, I guess, is correct. Uh, and then, you know, you own like a authentic uh, artwork from that. Um, and I guess it's actually been used outside of just like the kind of creative space. People are, I think, looking at it a bit in DeFi. So say you have like a loan or like a mortgage or something or other, you can kind of NFT that. And that's something you can probably like distribute around and like sell off or something or other. So people are even thinking about it creatively that way. And Tristan's right, like it has been chaotic uh, in the NFT space. And it's, you know, if I'm sure everyone saw Beeple's artwork sell for crazy money. You know, I do think that was that was purposely driven to bring a lot of hype and excitement to the to the area. And if I don't know if anyone knows the story uh, about the buyer, but that's that's probably an interesting tale to go look up in your own time. But uh, that's an interesting story in itself. Uh, in terms of NFTs, like as well, you know, what they were really originally thought to be used for, which is still still a strong use case now, but it's been sort of drowned out by the the art hype, uh, was things like identity, um, things like contracts, uh, things like medical records, you know, all these sort of elements. You don't want to be fungible. You want to be represented singularly and you want to be immutable was where the original sort of thought process around what NFTs would be used for came from. You know, really quickly that idea turned into, okay, we can actually use it for artwork and for asset ownership and all these other kind of concepts, which I think is a really, really valuable use case. Uh, we're just sort of seeing, though, it's, it's really at, you know, the nascent sort of stage, the really early stages of what this technology is going to be. 
Uh, I do think it brings a lot of value too. You know, a great example would be a photographer or a digital artist. You know, in reality, a lot of their work is really undervalued. Uh, so in that instance, you know, being able to bring a one of one and a singular authenticity to that kind of artwork is, is really interesting. Um, I think as well, the technology, like at the moment, a lot of NFTs are, you know, I, I sort of call them shells. There's not a lot of actual value underpinned inside the tokens or not something that's, that's as tangible as it probably should be or as, as directly correlated as it probably should be to the item you own. But we are seeing a lot of interesting development on this side. Uh, so a really good example, there's a couple of really good teams that have been working on music where they're now embedding the actual songs in hash code into the token, and then you can play the song through your, your iPhone, for example, through a hash code decipher that'll actually play the music straight into your iPod or into your iPhone. You know, that kind of use case is genuine where you could then own music that couldn't be copied. You know, no one could actually own the original unless you bought an original. And then if you got sick of the music and you were over the song, you could actually resell that asset. You know, that, that kind of future use case is, is coming and it's, it's going to be really interesting. You know, over the past year then, crypto and blockchain projects have sort of entered into the mainstream and um, and in, on all over, you know, Twitter and all these memes. So I suppose, what do you think has sort of accounted for this? And is there a risk of a bubble forming here? Look, there's, for starters, you know, the crypto booms, this is definitely not the first boom. You know, there, there's been a long string of booms. Uh, you know, I think the difference is the value has increased with each boom, you know, so uh, recently, I was talking to some of the early Bitcoin guys, and they were in the boom when when Bitcoin went to a dollar, um, and you know, talking about how crazy it was. Which you know, when you think of it in the context of today, you realize what an insane idea that was that that was a boom. Um, but I, I think there was a combination. One, we saw a really big lull in the market with with COVID starting, and then we saw probably a combination of boredom and people at home and a boom in terms of people paying attention to the technology, saw the price soar to, to some pretty dramatic heights. Um, you know, projects like Solana, you know, went, went into some extreme numbers in, in, in terms of actual growth, Algorand, other interesting projects that have, have come into the market have done crazy things. You know, Bitcoin passed the trillion dollar mark. Um, so, you know, I, I guess you, you could call it a bubble. It's, it's probably debatable. The market doesn't necessarily do what anyone thinks it's gonna do. Um, so it's really sort of doing, doing its own thing in many ways. Um, but, you know, I think the, the mainstream component has also been to do beyond the boredom piece and people spending more time online, which is obviously the home of, of crypto and blockchain. I think we've also seen a lot more mainstream coverage as more sort of mainstream individuals have entered the blockchain space. So I think a really good example is like the Solana team are a fantastic, credible team that people pay more attention with those kind of people start applying their intelligence and their their knowledge and their abilities into the blockchain space. You know, Algorand's a, a great example too. Um, Silvio McCarley, named as one of the grandfathers of cryptography, you know, one of the leads at MIT for, crypto, for, for cryptography, won the Turing Award, invented zero knowledge proofs. You know, these kind of minds that are considered some of the finest in the world actually devoting their entire lives to blockchain has brought a lot of different attention to the space. Um, so I think that's probably a big part of it as well. So for those interested in a career in crypto, how can they best position themselves? Say, do you have any recommendations with, um, you know, podcasts, newsletters? Um, yeah, it would be great to sort of get more insight into that. I would say in general, the barrier to entry is not too high compared to like coming from traditional tech where it's like people really care about your background, your CV, how much work experience you have. Um, I think crypto, like it's quite easy to get involved, even if you're not doing it from like the technical kind of perspective. I think there's like huge communities, like it's very, like it's all built on kind of like being open. Um, and so like people are pretty active, like crypto Twitter is like a real thing. Like everyone's kind of on there and just like, you know, talking about different stuff. Uh, everyone uh, like runs like discord communities for the different protocols where people can kind of like ask questions and like interact with teams and provide feedback and, a lot of these protocols like are open to like open source contributions. So you can actually like help out people without necessarily having to have like insane background. Um, and like, to be honest, yeah, like with getting hired in different like crypto companies, I don't think people put that onus on like, oh, you have to go to this like target school and you have to have done like this degree or something or other. Um, and I think what's really cool because like the space has only been around for <laughs> relatively like a short amount of time, especially like DeFi itself, like, I would say no one's an expert per se, because it's only been around for like a number of years. Um, so it's really easy to get like uh, sped up pretty quickly. Like I would say like I knew close to nothing about DeFi um, probably going into this year, but then obviously just like 
learning a ton, like everything's online. You just like read a lot of articles. There are a lot of like decent YouTube channels. I think Finematics on YouTube has like a bunch of great explainer videos on like a lot of the DeFi protocols. Um, and yeah, there are a ton of good podcasts. The ones I listen to a lot, obviously being biased. Uh, Anatoly runs a really good podcast called the Solana podcast. Uh, FTX, which is another big exchange, runs their own kind of podcast, which I enjoy thoroughly. Uh, and then Uncommon Core is another um, really good podcast by the guys from Three Hours Capital. Um, so I like kind of listen to those a, a lot. Uh, and yeah, I think it's just like really easy to get uh, sped up if you have like good initiative. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a journey and I think it's quite a frightening journey for those that are on the outside. How do you get in? You know, um, at the moment it's it's really online meetups, but meetup is the best place to get involved. Um you know because you're there and everybody's welcoming and you're there because you want to meet up and you want to learn so that's that's for me like the very basics to getting involved in the community um and then obviously yes there's a lots on podcasts um i've just added a link in from um gitcoin where you can earn bounties for doing different tasks a lot of the the crypto companies algorand's done it as well and um and uh, yeah, and Gitcoin's done as well, so GitHub. Um, so if you want, if you like programming and you want to learn different things, you can pick up some tasks and and earn crypto bounties for doing those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, lots of fun. Um, it, it does suck you in once you start. You start watching YouTube, start listening to podcasts, start talking to your friends about trading. Um, I went to um, St Kilda about six months ago. I was sitting by myself enjoying breakfast, and three guys next to me they were like watching the Binance, talking about watching Binance, about how to trade. And I said, "Oh, have you you bought your first Bitcoin?" And they're like, "No." So, you know, there's a lot of watching and then that fear of taking that first step and, and, and doing it. And you do need a little bit of hand holding, I think, for the first time with wallets and transferring. And it's a bit scary. And, but once you get the hang of it, you know, it's a lot of fun. Uh, look, I'll, I'll add one thing which kind of builds on both what Karen and Tristan were saying. Like I, I sort of said, if you, if you wanted a sort of a formula, if you've got no knowledge and want a formula of where to sort of start, I always sort of say, look at some of the, the top projects uh, in terms of actual blockchain protocols. You know, you've got Ethereum, Bitcoin, Solana, Algorand, Nia, Avalanche. Uh, look for who the founders are and then look up podcasts with those founders. I always think that's a really good sort of base ground if you just find projects you like uh, and then just start listening to what the founders are saying. And you can also join all their social channels. As Tristan said, I think another good one to learn a bit more about DeFi is I'll actually post it in the, in the channel, but go to DeFi Pulse look at the top five or 10 projects, look up the founders, look up their socials and just start digging into those projects. Because in reality, the top 10 are probably going to be the most useful for you at the moment. Um, but I think then also keep an eye on what's happening and, and really sort of you'll find your own groove and what really resonates with you, like what tech resonates with you, what products do, and you, then you really can sort of work your way into where is a, a good fit for, for you as well. Um, so, you know, I think that's sort of a good place to start if you just want to start digging in. Uh, I saw Adriana's in here too from Blockchain Pro. I saw she posted her podcast in the chat channel too, and she's, she's, a, she's a great one to listen to as well. Awesome. Great takeaways. Um, I'll definitely make sure to check out the resources. So excited. <laughs> um, I'll hand it over to Sharon now, now coming to the end of our events. Sharon? Yeah, so that does wrap up our intro to crypto session. I just We'd just like to extend a massive thank you to our panelists for coming on today. I'm sure everyone's gained a lot of really great insight. You can also find textbook ventures on our socials, um, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we also have a weekly newsletter. We have also launched recently an internship program. So definitely check out our website for more details. Other than that, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today and asking your questions. And I hope everyone is staying safe. Bye, everybody.